Good morning, all. Welcome to our Grand Rounds today. I'm Dr. Tata Pali, one of the PG Vibe 4 residents. Um, today, I have the privilege of introducing to you all Dr. Jerome Cook. Um, he is, has quite an illustrious educational background with his Bachelor's of Arts at Davidson College in North Carolina, Master's of Science in Psychology at Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee, and rounded up with the Doctor of Philosophy also at Vanderbilt University. Um, he has been at the VA since 1991 and currently is the program manager for the residential program for substance use and disorder um, use. There you go. All right. Welcome, Dr. Cook. You gotta get the microphone up a little closer. How, how's that? Everybody near me? All right. All right, we're talking about measurement-based uh, care and substance use disorders, and I um, want to thank you uh, for allowing me to be here. I want to uh, first note that uh, I don't have any um, conflicts of interest or no, uh, no commercial products or reference in my talk. I am going to be talking about the VA's um, use of uh, measurement-based care and their initiatives that they've developed in the past couple of years. and. Uh, being a, as an employee of the VA, uh, but uh, the opinions expressed are my own. So, um, can we go on here to the next one? So, my goal in the talk is a survey of measurement based care. I'll begin with defining the concept, identify its uh, development over time, particularly uh, within the, v, uh, the VA system, uh, the goals of measurement based care. Uh, targets for measurement um, and the examples that uh, are typically used uh, in the Veterans Administration as well as I'm going to share some details, uh, particularly of the specific measure that, that uh, we most uh, typically use, the brief addiction monitor. Uh, and I'm going to give you some uh, data on the how to use it in the individual as well as the program level and providing feedback to uh, both patients and staff. And present the advantages that have been identified for using measurement-based care uh, compared to treatment with, uh, without a focus upon measurement, some potential disadvantages, and include some barriers to implementation and, and hopefully have some time for questions. I want to thank uh, the department for inviting me to present on this topic because my anecdotal experience working at the Mountain Home VA has been that the psychiatry department particularly has emphasized a training that incorporates both measurement-based approaches that simultaneously have a focus on patient-centered model of training throughout the medical school as a whole as well. And that's not always the case uh, even at other VAs as a, a recent psychiatric services article uh, by Osmond and colleagues uh, was published this year, uh, they mentioned or they found that a survey of 230 mental health providers at 47 VA facilities, and they found that 58% reported collecting at least one measure on at least half of their patients. Uh, psychiatrists in this study were uh, least likely to report utilizing and sharing measures. Social workers and nurses were more likely to use measures, psychologists being the most likely in this survey to use and share measures. I would say it should be noted, however, because I don't think it was noted uh, adequately in the article, that this is, does not necessarily, uh, should not necessarily be seen as a lack of commitment to measurement-based care by any profession, as VA typically approaches care through a treatment team approach uh, rather than emphasis on the individual provider so the use and sharing of measures likely uh, here probably reflects professional role differences within a, a mental health team rather than any commitment or lack of commitment of any one discipline to measurement-based care. So we'll briefly go over some definitions. Kenny Forum is a nonprofit organization that was advocating for parity and quality in mental health and addiction services. They published an issue brief in 2015 uh, entitled Fixing Behavioral Health Care in America. And it was subtitled A National Call for Measurement-Based Care in the Delivery of Behavioral Health Services. And they refer to measurement-based care as the systematic use 
of symptom rating scales to drive clinical decision making. A review article also in 2015 by Scott and Lewis referred to measurement-based care as the practice of basing clinical care on client data collected throughout treatment. And let's see, I want to go back here. Let me go, there we go. And finally, most importantly, in January of 2018, the Joint Commission adopted measurement-based care as a critical function and defined it three elements. I'm not sure you can see the size of that slide, but basically it's about collecting data about the individual's current and past emotional and behavioral functioning, needs, strengths, preferences, and goals. Second element is analyzing the data to produce information about the individual's need for care, treatment, and services and identify the need for additional data. And the third element is making care or treatment uh, or service decisions based on the information developed about the needs, strengths, preferences, and goals of the individual served as well as his, uh, in her response to care, treatment, or services. So the VA has uh, referred to these three elements as collect, share, and act. And NBC, the, uh, the measurement-based care is specifically defined as using reliable, validated, and clinically appropriate measures of intake and at regular intervals. The second element of sharing is to uh, share the results from the measures uh, immediately and discuss with the veteran and other providers involved in the veteran's care. And the third element is ACT. So together, uh, Providers and veterans use the outcome measures to develop treatment plans, assess progress over time, and inform decisions about changes to the treatment plan over time. There's an article uh, published by uh, Aboria and colleagues from West Virginia, and they published a review of measurement-based care in uh, 2018, where they compiled a history of measurement-based care um, again, uh, first just doing a survey of, in, uh, of diagnoses uh, in Europe in the early 1800s. Um, the early 1900s saw the widespread use and measurement of intelligence through the concept of intelligence quotients and general intelligence factor. But uh, measurement-based care really uh, could be thought of as beginning in the 1980s, development of dsm 3 It's attempted a descriptive behavioral symptom criteria list use of rating skills and pharmaceutical research to measure patient response. Trevetti coined the term measurement-based care and defined it as the routine measurement of symptoms and side effects at each treatment visit and the use of a treatment manual describing when and how to modify medication uh, doses based on these measures in the study of the treatment of refractory uh, depression. So that was one of the earliest uh, instance of measurement-based care. The VA began planning for uh, what they called at the time routine outcomes monitoring in 2012, which was a precursor to the current uh, measurement-based care approach. And following the advocacy uh, for uh, NBC, as we'll call it, uh, that was uh, mentioned previously in, uh, by the Kennedy Forum, the VHA began planning for NBC implementation. Uh, there was a study by Gula et al. that uh, demonstrated the advantage and a significant response to and remission from moderate to severe depression in a randomized clinical trial with blind raters. There was significant improvement in the uh, measurement-based care condition compared to the standard treatment. Specifically, um, they found that uh, about 87% uh, of people uh, were likely to respond to treatment compared to 63% uh, in standard care, and 74% were uh, likely to report remission compared to uh, 29%. So it was in response to this and other published uh, findings, organizations, including the, the VA, began planning the institutional measurement-based care as a goal for mental health treatment. Some of the goals 
for measurement-based care include that it should be efficient, some measures should be brief, not time-consuming to the clinician or the, the uh, patient, rating scale uh, completed by the clinician, uh, or the patient should take no more than a few minutes to administer, it's generally between two and 20 minutes. Uh, so obviously, we want it to be statistically reliable and valid. Should be user-friendly. Um, a reflection of what is done clinically in clinical settings so it should be uh, uh, oftentimes it's administered sometimes in paper and pencil measures before uh, you see the clinician. Uh, recently, the behavioral health labs have been developed to use iPads and develop uh, uh, electronic uh, techniques so they can easily uh, develop um, measures that they can use on their phone or iPads to take quick measures that are uh, collected. Should be brief uh, and simple. Oh, be clinical, uh, meaningful, and useful, covering the criteria and symptom domains of the disorder. Uh, should be sensitive to changes uh, that may be induced by either uh, psychotherapy or medications. Should be easily extractable, not uh, embedded in progress notes for use in data monitoring. And so Scott and Lewis uh, in the article mentioned several examples of targets for measurement-based care in their review. They include uh, typical symptom measures for depression, anxiety, or craving. Second example uh, might include quality of life measures, uh, life satisfaction or role functioning, which may help them uh, measure long-term therapeutic goals. A third target may be to measure mechanisms or stages of change. Uh, which may help to tailor the type of treatment offered and measures of satisfaction with uh, session or therapeutic alliance may help to focus treatment on goals of treatment uh, or congruence of therapy goals. So things such as the working alliance inventory might be used for the treatment process uh, measure. Mechanisms of change might include um, the Eureka measure uh, which is uh, University of Rhode Island change assessment uh, measure, the Socrates measure with the stages of change rating instrument. The VA selected four instruments to utilize nationwide as part of their measurement based care initiative and uh, interagency task force had already selected the four symptom severity measures that they were going to use. Um, Items were chosen in uh, 2013 as generally reliable and valid measures of substance use disorders, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Uh, so they use a brief addiction monitor, which has uh, since been revised. Um, they uh, patient health questionnaire to assess for depression, generalized anxiety disorder, or anxiety, and a PTSD checklist for PTSD. Although there has been some literature critical of the rush to select the measures, particularly as it relates to the use of uh, the subscales. We'll talk about that when we talk about the reliability and validity issues. Um, the um, overall health measures that other people uh, may use may include that uh, or have been used in the past include the, uh, uh, the Veterans RAND 12-item uh, survey and the 36-item survey. Those are more self-administered health surveys that measure both health-related quality of life as well as um, various health domains, general health perception, physical functioning, role limitations to the physical or emotional problems, uh, bodily pain, energy or fatigue, social functioning, and mental health. And the BASIS 24 is a self-reported symptom survey that measures change in symptoms and problems over the course of treatment, and it's used in some programs as well. It provides uh, overall score in six subscales on depression and functioning, relationships, self-harm, emotional ability, psychosis, and substance use. I'll show you some uh, next few slides illustrate uh, how the measures can be used to uh, share some information regarding items on the brief addiction monitor with the veterans. And I've uh, got just a a, a test. Uh, score. You can see that you had three scales. There it is. 
It kind of looks like a Nintendo thing. It's not particularly a good graphic, but there you go. Um, I believe this is the uh, yeah the use scale, so you can measure test over time. We have uh, one administration on the red line, another administration on the blue, and compare those with the use, the risk factors, and the protective factors. And so you can use this chart in the um, in the graphing system, in the mental health assistant package, to do that. But it's actually uh, easier and generally speaking it's uh, um, to use the uh, individual scales and so we're going to see some of those items here so this is a sample um, where uh, someone in our program would uh, use our uh, the uh, first column in uh, July uh, a sample where they uh, at intake talk about their use in the last 30 days. We have an individual who's reporting uh, use of alcohol every day. Heavy drinking defined as five or more standard drinks in a setting. Not reporting any drug use. And you see that after a couple of months of treatment he's reporting no, uh, no use here. And of course, we uh, monitor that with breathalyzers as well as uh, mon we monitor drug use with the urine drug screen. But the items in the uh, free prediction monitor include an item related to physical health, uh, their perception of physical health. These are a mix of uh, uh, Likert scale items. So in this example, um, Like it score item to hear the individual identified his overall physical health as fair on a scale of zero to four. Um, the scale being from excellent to poor when he began treatment. Identifying his health as excellent two months later. He also, he also rated the impact of his urges and cravings on a like a scale model. And here it was uh, this range from not at all to extremely. And here he's reporting considerable urges and cravings at the beginning of treatment and no cravings at the end of treatment. And another uh, item that's like at scale is the relationship problems. And here he's reporting that on a scale, again, of uh, not at all to extremely reporting not being bothered by relationship problems at the beginning of treatment nor at the end of treatment. So identifying problems early in the treatment may help the therapist identify the needs which may need to be met concurrently with the substance abuse treatment. So here the physical concerns are identified early in treatment, allow for discussion and uh, treatment of these concerns. Craving strengths may reflect the need to provide counseling or cognitive-based uh, behavioral interventions, such as urge surfing or the use of medication-assisted therapy to address cravings. Other risk factors uh, include the number of days in the last 30 that the individual experienced disturbed sleep. And here they uh, just use the number of days as a continuous measure. So this person is was reporting at treatment intake uh, in the past 30 of 30 days he had uh, disturbed sleep patterns. After two months of treatment he's still reporting um, 14 days in the past 30 where he experienced disturbed sleep and we see that you know, quite frequently as one of the uh, most prevalent uh, concerns and complaints of people entering substance abuse treatment. and take some time to resolve. It may uh, reflect uh, the need for cognitive behavioral therapy interventions for insomnia, which is an evidence-based program that the VA offers now, as well as sleep medications. In 
terms of protective factors, I like it scale items here include their confidence in uh, no use or confidence in their ability to remain abstinent. Here the in individual reported being extremely confident both at intake and uh, two months later. Uh, were the individual to have ex expressed less confidence, this may have reflected the opportunity to employ some motivational interviewing techniques regarding goals or cost-benefit analyses of use. Patient report at the outset of treatment also here that uh, religion or spiritual uh, concerns were not at all important, but that two months later was reported to be uh, considerably important. And this may provide an opportunity to reinforce insight or enhance motivation, oh, here, keep going. enhance motivation for continued spiritual growth. The sole yes no item in uh, the BAM is a question about adequate income, reflecting that the patient did not have concerns in this area. Here, so it's converted to a like it scale, but uh, this reflects that he felt he had adequate income to address his um, needs. Regarding other uh, protective factors, he noted at the treatment outset that he had been to uh, no self-help groups in the past 30 days and had been to uh, eight of the last 30 days that participated in self-help groups two months into his treatment. At the beginning of treatment, he had uh, only spent 10 of uh, 30 days on productive work and two months into treatment reports that uh, he spent 20 days and uh, uh, that may be related to his involvement in uh, work therapy as well. That's often. So the subscales present uh, a rough but fairly uh, dramatic uh, summary of changes that may be presented to the patient to elicit their reaction and and to reinforce positive change or to highlight ongoing challenges. So here the individual, you can see that uh, on a scale of 0 to 90, he uh, got a score of 60 at the outset of treatment and 0 two months later. The scales go from 0 to 180 on uh, risk factors and protective factors. And just by coincidence, he happens to score 77 on both. So you can see his risk factors are uh, down to 14 out of the 180 on the summary scale of risk factors, while his protective factors have uh, increased from 77 to 140 out of 180. So we can use this uh, data not just not only to present, and that's what is uh, required that we collect and share with the veteran and talk about what ongoing challenges he may have. Um, but we can also share this uh, with at program level data. I've got some examples of that. So I'll include here some uh, a cumulative analysis of patients that were admitted to our residential program between May 1st and August 23rd. Uh, we had 181 uh, patients that completed a BAM in that uh, a brief addiction monitor in that period. And that covered a period from uh, May to uh, late August. 102 of those, or 56%, completed a uh, at least one follow-up during that period. And the results here show that of those that completed the, uh, the 102 that completed the follow-up, another uh, use score from going from 22.6 down to 2.5, and their risk factors going from 86.5 down to 45, and protective factors increasing. And specifically, when we look at the item level uh, data, this bar chart reflects the change among those who completed the initial and follow-up assessment. The percent reporting 
um, any alcohol use, decrease from 50% down to 12% as a follow-up. Heavy alcohol use is reported at 47% at treatment outset and decreased down to 7%. And drug use, 41% down to 15%. The result of the question of any craving um, in the past 30 days began very high, 86%. And at the follow-up, was reduced only to, down to 68%. And this is probably in keeping with the understanding of craving as a lasting phenomenon and symptom of addiction that may be present for a lengthy uh, and indeterminate period of time. It's also perhaps important to communicate to our patients that while other aspects of the quality of life may improve with abstinence, as will be shown with the additional items, um, the patients uh, should be alert to the normality of experiencing cravings for extended periods of time, as well as the importance of managing cravings when they occur. And so here you just have the total of uh, 68% reporting any substance use and then 21 percent at follow-up. Having said that patients should be aware of and alert to the persistence of craving, um, the positive message is that patients report that they're less bothered by the cravings, perhaps due to the lessened intensity of cravings. Uh, oftentimes, particularly in residential uh, care settings, just taking uh, the patient out of the setting where the environmental triggers occur can help to reduce craving. Hopefully also uh, teaching some uh, cognitive behavioral skills such as uh, urge surfing or um, functional analysis or cost-benefit analysis can help to reduce cravings as well. Um, so here, Those that are reporting considerable or greater craving at their first assessment, 62%. And by the follow-up, it's down to 25%, reporting considerable or greater after uh, 30 days or more uh, treatment. These are the individual items on the risk factor scale. And when examining the risk factors, it's also interesting to share that our, our patients on average change their uh, description of their health from, from fair to good. So this would be, a, uh, again, a Likert scale item that is, was uh, modified to um, be scored from 0 to 30. But basically, it's a, a five-item measure. And this is equivalent, basically, where they're reporting only fair health at outset uh, and improves uh, at follow-up. With sleep, again, uh, this one is where they were uh, a continuous measure. So they were bothered by sleep problems at treatment outset at 17 days out of the past 30. And that's reduced down to about 11. The uh, Third item is the risk factor is uh, the degree to which they're bothered by depression, anxiety, anger, um, or stress. And so here they report they're bothered by approximately 17 days out of the last 30, and this reduces to seven and a half. The craving again is reduced. Uh, and cravings were most likely to get down from moderate to slight, as this was a, a like it scale item. The number of days they were in around risky people or situations, they reported it uh, from eight to one and a half days in the past 30. And the degree to which they were bothered by uh, the number of days they were around risky people, places, or things. reduced from uh, about eight to two here, and the uh, degree to which they were bothered by social problems. The 
final uh, subscale is protective factors. Protective factors seem less uh, vulnerable to change. Um, so they probably reflect more of internal uh, self-efficacy. You have a uh, confidence and ability to abstain. It did improve. And all, you can see that, by the way, all of the, uh, all of the use decreased, all of the risk factors decreased, and all of the protective factors increased uh, from one measurement to the other. But probably less, uh, less significantly so for the protective factors. Confidence and ability to abstain increased slightly. Um, the number of days that people participate in self-help groups increased slightly from 3.3 uh, to 7 approximately. The degree to which uh, you felt that uh, spiritual or religious concerns were supportive. Uh, I'll go to the specific uh, question is, does your religion or spirituality help support your recovery? And so you can see that did not change a great deal. This is probably a consistent factor. What, uh, the, this measure uh, is the... Um, our item is in the past 30 days, how many days did you spend much of the time at work, school, or doing volunteer work? And that increased slightly. Do you have adequate income? That was a, a yes or no measure, of it to increase slightly. And social support. In the past 30 days, how many days did you contact or spend time with any family members or friends? who are supportive of your recovery. And you can see that that increase. So of the protective factors, these were more susceptible to change and uh, because these are more of a behavioral function in terms of the number of days that they actually attended self-help or the number of day that days they spent with supportive others as opposed to uh, items that might be considered more to reflect one's self-efficacy or uh, sense of spirituality, which more may be a more stable factor. So we've got some uh, advantages of measurement-based care. <clears throat> this is something that uh, from Go and colleagues, that they published an influential article that noted the, the benefits of measurement-based care in a randomized controlled clinical trial. Um, and they noted improved outcome that we uh, noted previously. And they're also more likely to find insight into treatment progress. Uh, so um, uh, there are several studies that have noted that uh, patients appreciate uh, um, being, uh, having data on their progress. Uh, they can monitor their symptom reduction. The act of monitoring itself, the act of uh, uh, taking uh, a measurement of one's symptoms tends to, to change the nature of that. Um, you can highlight important treatment targets. And so in the discussion and sharing with the veteran, you may be able to identify um, significant progress that uh, can be encouraging to the patient or challenges that remain. You might also be able to distinguish improved versus uh, regress patients, so those that are reporting that their confidence is going down, the opportunity for discussion about what's happening in their uh, environment or within themselves that are, are, is challenging their confidence and their abilities so something uh, can be addressed and that uh, counseling can uh, help to identify what are the sources of the, the change in confidence. You can uh, reduce symptom deterioration as well as improve satisfaction with care. It tends to enhance the therapeutic relationship, generally speaking, uh, uh, even though sometimes clinicians can, may oftentimes see the assessment as uh, distancing, oftentimes the, the patients report that it can be uh, uh, a sign of caring, that they're taking the time to uh, use uh, measures, particularly standardized measures, and taking the time that, where they can see their progress. Um, 
so it can enhance their uh, that therapeutic relationship and communication and improve collaboration among providers. An example of that, uh, I haven't mentioned uh, using the patient health questionnaire, but uh, we also have a, a, a group for cognitive therapy for depression with substance use uh, disorders. And we'll generally assign people to those groups depending on their uh, scores and their acknowledgement of uh, concerns about depressed mood. And Note that when it, uh, if you see significant changes in that, involve the other members of the care team to uh, psychiatrists, social workers, chaplains, um, depending on what uh, factors have been involved in changes in the scores on their uh, PHQ-9. Some other advantages might be active involvement. Uh, you improve the accuracy of the clinical judgment. Uh, so that you're no longer uh, guessing about their um, responses. You have evaluative data, which I uh, just noted, so uh, which uh, is appreciated uh, typically by uh, people in accreditation and uh, managers. You're closing the gap between research and practice, um, enhancing clinical decision-making process, individualizing treatment, and using uh, it for uh, and, uh, clinicians from a wide variety of backgrounds uh, and experience levels can use it. It's feasible to implement on a large scale, as we all know. It's a national system now in the VA. And got an example of where the VA is. You can see this is mental health residential treatment program. And it's a routine outcome monitoring. You can see the increases over time here. Um, and the percent of outpatients using the brief addiction monitor. And going up over time. So this, this is part of the, uh, the measurement-based care initiative. There are some problems, though, uh, potential pitfalls with measurement. Um, any physics majors in here? No. Okay. The Heisenberg principle, we know that uh, once you observe something, it tends to change the, th the thing that you is being observed. I came across a good heart's law. I don't know if we have any economics majors either, but uh, uh, basically a summary of a good heart's law is that when you start to um, measure a... Uh, once you define, uh, the summary basically is that once you define a, a measure and it becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And the idea with that is you get into the notion of uh, gaming the system. Uh, it's been called denominator management. There's an example here where there was a study by Harris that found that VA programs had a marked decrease in the denominator when executive pay was based on a performance measure of continuity of care. So instead of uh, trying to improve the numerator, so the numerator being the number of people receiving a guideline appropriate treatment, and the number, uh, denominator being the number of patients likely to benefit, by excluding people into the denominator, they were able to uh, keep the ratio up, and so the financial incentives becomes a factor in gaming the system. Uh, I remember uh, one incident that uh, I was told about uh, several years ago where you have to, uh, it was a requirement that you come up with a uh, psychosocial, uh, biopsychosocial uh, integration within 15 working days and treatment in a residential setting, and so a program created the, their program as a 14-day treatment program. So they gamed the system by the 15th day. They were, they were automatically discharged. That, and that doesn't typically fly, but that was something where people try to game the system when you uh, try to, to use the measures as a target. What are some barriers to measurement-based care? Um, 
They can be time consuming. Uh, that's the most common reason cited. Uh, but uh, typically when they're done uh, outside the office in a way in the area, they take uh, no time, uh, uh, very little time of the professional time and can be entered it, uh, as well automatically through the use of iPads or tablets. Um, the measures are designed uh, for research use, not for clinician use. Uh, sometimes there, there may be uh, times where you're wanting to measure other aspects of care in the moment. The ratings produced by measures might not always be clinically relevant, uh, and administering rating scales might interfere with establishing rapport with patients. Again, like I mentioned, um, clinicians may have the mistaken or I shouldn't say mistaken, but impression that sometimes it can be distancing, particularly the more measures you pile on. And so that is a concern um, as the number of measures uh, increases. The perception that measures are uh, not more useful than clinical assessment exists, and that um, measurement-based care can be over-systematizing and depersonalizing. Uh, and some measures, such as standardized diagnostic interviews, are often too cumbersome or unwieldy. Other barriers might include costs or lack of resources to implement measurement-based care, uh, limited training, um, lack of protocols or training manuals, lack of consensus to which instruments should be used for a given disorder. Um, there may be uh, absence of a requirement to use uh, measurement-based care, uh, but as we're seeing both in the VA and uh, uh, Medicaid and Medicare systems are requiring more uh, measurement-based care as a standard of care. Um, so now there are incentives to use it, which can be helpful to use it, but it can also affect um, the use. There's a complexity of patients with multiple overlapping uh, comorbidities, and this came up uh, with uh, as an issue just in the uh, substance use disorder program uh, because while we're doing the uh, and required to use the brief addiction monitor, uh, of course, many of our patients are also reporting depression, anxiety, and PTSD issues. And so now if we are using measurement-based care to address all four of those issues, then it, it can become time consuming. This is briefly, there was a uh, survey too. This is more having to do with uh, quality measures and perceptions of care among patients with substance use disorders, where they did a survey. Uh, and these are more process measures that are done. Um, to rather than measurement-based care, but uh, they look at the initiation of treatment, engagement with treatment, um, and uh, as well as post-hospitalization follow-up within seven and 30 days, and whether they received pharmacotherapy or received psychotherapy. And they found it in this study that uh, among over 2,000 patients in the VA system, uh, that uh, treatment engagement, receiving psychotherapy, and psychosocial treatment were associated with perceived improvement. Uh, treatment initiation and follow-up um, after hospitalization in the 730 days were not as important as the other factors. So, um, that's what I had for that study. I've got the uh, uh, references here, but I'll go ahead and close it out and ask if you've got any uh, questions or comments. Yes. With no, the, the the one that the right before the references. Correct. Um, so they found benefit with treatment engagement therapy and and psychosocial treatment, but not with initiation and follow up. So what does that mean in terms of uh, relevance? Um, because it sounds like the beginning and the end didn't, but everything in the middle did. I think this is uh, just a matter of, uh, uh, and 
got the, uh, the study was by Hebner. It was uh, not a study specifically so much of measurement-based care, but just the idea of having a relationship uh, with an individual uh, providing uh, psychosocial or psychotherapy uh, care was useful rather than, than um, was more asso strongly associated with perceived improvement than the number of days after which they were contacted. So it was, the, it was more about the, the human contact uh, is what I read into that particular study. Any other questions? Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Cook, All so right. much for your presentation. Thank you.